So I went to, my, my parents raised me as a Quaker. The Quakers were the big weirdos in England in the 1600s. And they got thrown out and founded Pennsylvania. So I was raised in Newtown, Pennsylvania, and then I went to a Quaker college in Ohio. And we were fighting the Vietnam War when I graduated. Um, <clears throat> I graduated from Wilmington College in 1969, at pretty much the height of the, the Vietnam War. We had, we had um, something called the Kent State shootings the following year in 1970, where the National Guard just shot students on a campus in Ohio, you know, some miles away from Wilmington. So my boyfriend didn't want to be drafted and I got a better scholarship from Canada anyway and we moved to Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1969. Um, he was getting a Master of Fine Arts at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. I was getting Master of Arts in English Literature at Dalhousie University. So I come from language to mm -hmm. art. So we get there and it is the um, coolest art school in North America because they were bringing all the conceptual artists of the day through the school. Vito Conchi, Doug Hubler, Dan Graham, Joseph Kosuth, and Joseph Boyce, um, Peter Kabelka, also European artists, most of them boys most of them white, um, <clears throat> Lawrence Wiener, <clears throat> Richard Serra, Ian Wilson, the list goes on and on. Uh, anyway, um, there's a piece by Jan Dibbets that really annoyed me. <laughs> he, he was uh, moving a, in a public park, he had established a bird feeder and a bird used the bird feeder and he moved the bird feeder three feet every day through the park. So he was enlarging the territory of the bird. Who cares? This is not vital somehow to life on the planet. So I, first of all, I didn't want, I didn't know whether I could call myself an artist I was an English lit major, um, but I would hang out at the art college because the cool the kids were cooler at the art college than they were at Dalhousie University. Um, and <clears throat> I started doing conceptual, concept-based work um, that critiqued the kind of conceptual art that I felt the men were doing that did not actually engage with what was really happening in the world. So the first work of visual art I ever did was called Breast Forms Permutated, mm -hmm. which looks at a shape that has no limit. Every single woman on the planet is gonna have different boobs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a spoof of the work of Saul LeWitt. Saul LeWitt was um, doing line drawings, uh, Every, let's see, he, he, would, he, would, he would hand out instructions for his drawings. So um, all lines going uh, north, south, east and west, red and blue. You know, he gave, out, he gave out instructions. He didn't do the drawing. He gave out the instructions for the drawing on a three by five card. <clears throat> so the locus of the art is not in the three by five card, and actually not on the, the wall drawing either. It's in the, in the concept for the drawing. So, so I started doing concept-based work that I thought engaged with my female body and other female bodies. <clears throat> what I see happening is that the the artist 
who used to be separate from society and hand, you know, standing on some mountain over here is now equal with everybody because everybody has phones and everybody's taking selfies. And, um, so everybody can participate in the, the discourse about how you look and the image that you present. And, um, <clears throat> I think it's, the discourse is definitely changing. There, there's a, a lot of discussion about weight you're allowed to be fatter now than you were allowed to be in, certainly when I was a young woman, uh, you had to be a stick, you had to be a pencil, really, really thin, that was the ideal. Now I think we're softening that ideal because of the influx of real people mm -hmm. and real images. Mm -hmm. Well, so I moved to Canada with my boyfriend, uh -huh. and then he dumped my ass. He broke up with me, <clears throat> which was at the time a just terrible thing. But um, it gave me a chance to put my personality back together by myself, um, not in relation to a, a man, <clears throat> and um, this was all happening in a in an art school environment that was dominated by men. <clears throat> that was that was the way of the world at the time. Um, when I decided to be an artist, I went to Jerry, who was my painting teacher at Wilmington College, who had moved to this school and told us this is the coolest art school in North America. You have to come up here. And I said I wanted to be an artist, and he said, "Women don't make it in the art world." Um, and it was true at the time. There was a, a critic, Lucy Lepard, who decided to give 10 years of her life to just sh curating shows of women because women were so behind the curve of, of success. Um, so she put me in a show. I met other women artists through that catalog and, and ultimately moved to New York because she told me, yes, you are an artist, and yes, there are other women who are doing this concept-driven performance work like you are. So it was very important for you, right? Her Lucy influence. Lepard, very, very yes. important. Uh, there are so many repressive societies, and then even here in the United States, there are very new, newly repressive laws being enacted, for example, the right to a legal abortion is being challenged at all times in the state of Mississippi, in the state of Texas, in Alabama, in Georgia. It's difficult to get an abortion. You, you are not, you don't have freedom of decision as a young woman. You don't think about, you don't think about that. You think mm -hmm. about the audience of one, the audience of the self. Mm -hmm. I'm doing my work for myself, and if other people benefit from seeing it, then I'm really, really happy. But I don't, I mean, I'm, try, I'm thinking about things that are universal to you and to me mm -hmm. at your age and at my age that we can both relate to. We can both, because we share misery, exactly in injustice. We we share feelings. So um, let's see. This is our. We were born in my living loft at one twelve Franklin Street. I was living with two roommates. <laughs> <clears throat> and Franklin Furnace was just a clearing in the front. It started as a bookstore, and immediately um, an artist wanted to read from her book, so the performance art program was born, and an artist stapled his book up the wall and across the ceiling, so the installation program was born. <clears throat> so for 20 years, from 1976 to 1996, we were on Franklin Street in Tribeca, which is in Lower Manhattan. 
And during those 20 years, um, um, America went through the culture wars. The culture wars when <clears throat> we were in the 70s, experimental artists were the darlings of the art world, allowed to experiment freely <clears throat> and wildly. In the 80s, we became suspicious because we were showing images of sex, of naked bodies, and <clears throat> that never changed, but the politicians found out about it <coughs> and started to, you know, they were, they were thrilled because um, here was something that we could deride and separate from the, <clears throat> from the regular God-fearing taxpayer people could say the artists are bad. The artists are are eating away at the virus of the eat, the virus eating away at the health of the body politic. So <clears throat> so we experienced the culture wars in 1984 when uh, our our show Carnival Knowledge, which consisted of installation work and artist books and um, performance work, um, which was looking at whether, whether pornography, whether there could be such a thing as feminist pornography. That, that was the question that the curators asked. <clears throat> but the, the Morality Action Committee picked up a brochure on our front desk and wrote letters to each of our funders complaining that we had shown pornography to 500 children per day when there were zero children coming through the show. It was all grown-up people. But but then we were on the defensive. We had to defend ourselves with, with slides of the installations and um, <clears throat> it was it was a, a very difficult time. And then a few years later we got our performance space got closed down by the New York City Fire Department. Somebody had turned us in as an illegal social club. Uh, so then we thought about how, how are we going to give freedom of expression to the artists and where exactly is that freedom of expression going to be offered? And we decided to go virtual, go into the internet. Although it won't be free forever, it's freer right now than so-called real time and space. So uh, we went virtual on February 1st, 1997 and started collaborating with a dot com to present performance art on the internet. Pretty soon what the artists wanted to do got more complicated than the dot com was willing to put up with. So we then moved to Parsons School of Design because they had more uh, software and facilities. And and then after that, we thought <coughs> what we really ought to do is just go for the concept that the artist has and try to find the venue that is appropriate for that concept and not partner with anybody, partner with everybody, We, you know, whoever is, is appropriate for that idea. So that is what we do today. We give money to crazy artists and help them to find a venue to do their projects. And then we preserve the documentation of the event uh, because this work is ephemeral, concept-based, usually performance work, but that doesn't mean that it's not important just because it's so ephemeral. Thank you very much. You're welcome, welcome, <laughs> welcome.